service? Did you? When the man next to you died and they threw him overboard, and all you thought was, oh, there'll be more water to drink. You didn't even care that he was dead. And the sailor got up and said, Oh, God, we consign this soul to your keeping and the body to thee. And he couldn't remember anymore. <laughs> and someone beside you said, Deep. And then someone was I. Actually, you're almost well now. Have you ever thought about what you're going to do after you leave the hospital? Have you any friends or relatives to go to? An uncle and aunt, my mother's sister, they live in New York. Would you know their address? My mother told me to write if anything happened. Then do it, right away. But I don't know them. I haven't seen them. I don't even know what they look like. What difference does that make? They'll certainly be anxious to hear from you. Oh, but Dr. Winters, there's so much to explain and I... Tell you what, I'll do all the explaining. You just write a note to enclose. Now, what is the name? Mrs. Norbert Lamont. Mm-hmm. 1059 Fremont Building. New York City. Good morning. Have you eaten everything? I'm not hungry. Well, uh, maybe this will give you an appetite. Who is it from? It's probably from your aunt and uncle. But it's not Postmark New York. It's Belleville, Louisiana. Why don't you open it and find out? But it is. It's from Aunt Emily. My letter must have been forwarded from New York. They're in Belleville at a place called Rossignol. What do you know? Belleville's only about 90 miles away. Go on. Read it. What does it say? They want me. They want me to come. Of course they do. Go on. Are you surprised to find us here? Norbert's grandfather left him this place years ago. But of course we never lived here. Only now with sugar the way it is, we decided to come down and look it over. And we are just camping out, but I'm going to have your room ready for you, and you must be sure and let us know. Is that all one sentence? My darling sister would want us to take care of you, I know. But you must stay in the hospital until you're quite well, of course. The doctor told us how ill you've been. All right, Miss, this is Belleville. For someone, young lady? Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Lamont. I thought they'd be here to meet me. Lamont? Lamont? Mr. and Mrs. Norbert Lamont. Mm, never heard of them. But they live here. They have a place called Rossignol, a plantation. Rossignol? Oh, that's over on Bayou Grand Terre. But I never heard of Mr. and Mrs. Lamont. She got off the 248 from New Orleans. Seemed kind of surprised no one was here to meet her. Well, hello. Hey, not so fast, young lady. You lie still and take deep breaths. This is the doctor, Dr. Grover. That's right. Painted. 
All in a heap. Too much sun. But you'll be all right as soon as I can get you out of this slab-sided oven. That's enough, Lee. There you are. Now, you lie quiet for a while, and then I'll take you over to my office where it's cool. No. And then out to rushing, y'all. No. No, I've got to go back. But there's no train to late this afternoon, miss. 7.14, and it's usually late. But I must go back. Don't tell me you came all this way just to turn around. I must. I must. But aren't the Lamonts expecting you? I don't know. They don't know me. They don't want me. Please let me go back. Well, if you want to go back, all right. But you can wait in my office until time for the next train. Can't I stay here? Oh, that'd be a pretty long wait. You better come along, Miss Calvert. Drink this, slowly and in small sips. People who've just come out of hospital should take everything that way. How did you know I'd been in the hospital? Oh, I know quite a bit about you, Miss Kelvin. You know the Lamonts, you're just out of the hospital and you're on your way to Russing, y'all. You know my aunt and uncle? Well, only by name. Finish your medicine. See, I picked up the things that fell out of your purse when you fainted. There was a letter addressed to you to the Cortland Hospital in New Orleans. You feel better? Yes, thank you. I thought you would. You shouldn't feel so upset about fainting on the platform. The heat was enough to flatten anybody. It wasn't only the heat or that I'd been ill. It was... It was the fear of being all alone, of having no one to turn to. Not anyone. You see, my uncle and aunt are my only relatives, and they're perfect strangers. I haven't even seen them. And when they weren't at the station to meet me, I thought they'd gone back to New York. Well, they'd hardly do that if they thought you were coming. You ought to like Rossin, y'all. It's a perfect place to convalesce after, well, after whatever it was you were in the hospital for. I was on the Valdera. I read about the Valdera. Only four of us survived. I woke up in a hospital in New Orleans. Constantly there was the delirious nightmare of the open boat. I thought it would drive me insane. I was afraid that someday it would be the same whether I were awake or not. I wanted to give in, but they forced me back. Dr. Winters wrote to my aunt and they said they wanted me. But they weren't at the station. Why don't we take my car and drive out to see what happened? I've got a call to make out that way. If they're not there, I'll get you back in time for the train. You're very kind. You won't be able to see the water from rusting, y'all. Too many trees in between. Trees and sunlight. So quiet, you can almost hear it. Dr. Winter said all I needed was rest and quiet. You'll have plenty of that. It's about all we get around here. Sometimes I think we overdo it. The only excitement's when a visitor comes to town. You know, I think I'll drop by rusting, y'all, every day or so. But I wouldn't think of troubling yourself. Trouble? It's the kind of trouble everybody's looking for. But don't forget, I saw you first. Well, here we are. There's Russin, y'all. Are you Mr. Lamont? Uh, no, my name is Sidney. I'm staying here. Oh, I'm Dr. Grover. I brought you a visitor. Indeed. Yes, this is Miss Leslie Calvin, Mrs. Lamont's niece. Why, what a surprise. What a delightful surprise for your aunt and your uncle. Oh, but I sent them a telegram. A telegram? You did? I don't recall them mentioning it. Here, let me get your bag. Then they're not expecting me? Mm -hmm. Oh, forgive me for keeping you standing. Uh, come in, come in. There was no one to meet me at the station. And I tried to telephone, but the name wasn't listed. So Dr. Grover brought me out. Oh, how nice. How very nice of you. You must stay to dinner. Emily will be delighted. <laughs> Emily! Emily! You've come a long way, Miss uh, Calvin. Yes. Hmm? 
From Batavia. Batavia. Emily, here's Leslie all the way from Batavia. Leslie, my dear child. Darling, we've been so worried about you. If we'd only known when you were coming, we'd have... Norbert? Norbert? But I did send... Oh, excuse me, Dr. Grover, this is Aunt Emily. Oh, how do you do? How very kind of you to drive her out. Um, won't you come in and sit down? Thank you, but I... Uh, did you get the telegram, Emily? Oh, no. But don't worry about it, darling. I'm sure it will turn up someday. Oh, there you are, Norbert. This is your uncle, dear. How do you Poor do it? child, nobody met her. You really should have let us know, dear. And Dr. Grover, so kind. How do you do? Hello. I tried to telephone you and you're not in the book. That's odd. Of course, it's not in our name. It's listed under Clee because, naturally, Mr. Clee was the only one living here at the time. So, you see, dear, you should have looked for Cleve. But, Aunt Emily, you didn't say anything about him in your letter. Tuna fish. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I don't know why they do those things. They promise you and then... I'll see Florella. Oh, no, Perhaps a chicken please. or something with... You make me nervous. I'm quite sure Florella can produce something. I told Dr. Grover you'd want him to stay to dinner. Providing... Oh, we'd be delighted to have you stay, Doctor. Of course, a simple meal under the circumstances. Oh, no but... thanks. I'm afraid I have to get back. Oh. Oh, that's too bad. Well, some other time, perhaps. Thank you. So glad to have you with us, Leslie. Make yourself at home. Emily, I, uh, I'm right in the middle of this. Yes, I know. You go ahead. I'll be with you in a moment. I'll show you to your room, dear. Well, I'll say goodbye now. I'll be out to see you soon, very soon. Thank you. And behave yourself. Goodbye. Goodbye. I know you must be tired. Of course, if I'd only known you were coming. I wonder if I could see Mr. Lamont a moment. He seems to have disappeared. He's so engrossed with the book he's writing that he's hardly aware of what's going on around him. Well, in that case, maybe I'd better tell you what's on my mind. I don't want to alarm you, but Leslie's been through a terrible time. I know. The doctor at the hospital wrote us all about her. Well, I just want to explain that she's in a very nervous, unsettled condition. Exhausted, physically and emotionally. She has nightmares. She's afraid she's turning into a mental case. Well, that's ridiculous, of course, but she shouldn't sit around and brood about things. No, we do everything. But everything we can to help her. Just tell Mr. and Mrs. Lamont not to question her too much. Try to make her forget it. They would anyway, I'm sure, but I thought I'd better mention it. It's very kind of you, Doctor. Thank you. We'll do everything we can for her. Goodbye, Mr. Sidney. Goodbye, Doctor. Heavens, it's stuffy. This room hasn't been used since. Darling, you shouldn't have carried your bag up. No, but would. But he's so absent minded. All wrapped up in his work. Scientific. A book he's doing for the government. I help him with the typing, but really, I don't understand a word. Sit down, dear. And let. No, no, no. I want to help you unpack. My only niece arrives, and this is the reception she gets. No one to meet her at the station. And now this room. That needs dusting and sweeping so badly. That Florella. Aunt Emily, really, I don't mind. And you must. And no flowers. Oh, well. Tomorrow is another day. Perhaps we'll do better tomorrow. I don't want to be any trouble to you, Aunt Emily. Trouble? Imagine you being any trouble. <laughs> you don't know what this means to me, Aunt Emily. In the hospital, I thought I was all alone. Now I have a home, and Uncle Norbert, and you, my own people, who love me. You see, I've never had any children of my own. That's why your coming means so much to me. I hope you'll be happy here, Leslie. Oh, I know I will. Sit down, darling. I have to see about dinner. Mr. Sidney is so particular. He's so awfully particular. And there's no salmon. You'll hear a gong just before dinner, then... I thought perhaps you might like to have this. It was painted of your mother just before she was married. It's lovely, isn't it? Yes, lovely. We weren't much alike. She's so pretty, isn't she? Christine always was the pretty one, but I didn't mind. I think you're pretty, Aunt Emily. Oh. 
You'll hear the gong for dinner, dear. I'll try to be back before. Look at this dust and look at these flowers. The room is a pigsty. Sorry, sir. I'll get a dust pillow. Do. Look at that basket. Well, you know I don't like that sort of thing. It's disgusting. He runs the plantation for us. How do you do, Miss Calvin? How do you do? Thank you. Oh, and this is Florella. How do you do, Miss Leslie? I hope you'll forgive our funny silver, Leslie. We're just camping out down here. All of our things are stored in New York, you know. It's a pity the way some of these houses are let go. Mirrors need resilvering, draperies need cleaning. And look at this chair, crying for attention. Yes, of course. I'll have Florella put some furniture polish on it. Furniture polish. Emily, have you any conception of what this beautiful wood really needs? Why, you're quite right. It needs refinishing. I'll have it done right away. Aunt Emily, have you decided whether to stay here or not? Oh, uh, no, dear, we haven't. You see, your uncle and I have been discussing things, but there are so many problems Emily, about... Emily, um... will you pass the salt, please? Oh, yes, sir. Why don't you sell Rossignol, Uncle Norbert? What? Well, I only meant with sugar so scarce that you'd probably get a good price for it. Of course he would. That's what I've been telling him. Besides, the price of sugar will not be so high after the war when we import it again. Antiques, business, sugar. He knows all about everything. Who's that talking in the kitchen, Emily? Ring the bell. When did you arrive in America, Miss Calvin? Florella? Was that the kitchen? It's, uh, it's just Pearson. He just come to help me with the dishes. Pearson's not allowed here anymore. No company during working hours, Florella. Yes, sir. Florella must learn. Pearson must learn, too. Oh, dear. Servants are such a... Well, I mean, she's very young. You understand. I suppose you've had bad Perhaps, experiences with... Perhaps, uh, Emily, there may not be any servant problem in the East Indies. When did you leave Batavia? Over a year ago. A year? Well, where have you been? I mean... In any bombings? Yes. Did you get away ahead of the Japs? Yes. Nip and tuck, huh? How did you manage it? On a trading boat. Leslie, darling, you're not eating a thing. I do think you should have a hot biscuit. Would you tell us some more about him, Miss Calvin? We're so removed from the scene of action in this peaceful backwater. I went to Diego Suarez in Madagascar. And I had fever. Poor child. Leslie, dear, you've no butter. I don't want any, thank you. I'm to play. Go on. What happened? It was Vichy French. They wouldn't give us a visa. And we ran out of our money and we cabled to America. It took a long time to come. Exasperating delays in wartime. I suppose you took passage for New Orleans from there. Yes. And the boat sank. <laughs> Dear, we should have realized. Do you want me to come with you, Leslie? Dear, Leslie, wait. You mustn't. Jittery, isn't she? Very trying on the nerves. Very. Fried chicken again. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Miss Leslie. Hope you rested well, my dear. Yes, thank you. After a good night's sleep, one feels like a different person. Sorry about the little unpleasantness last evening. Poor Emily was so upset, 
if we'd only realized... Oh, please don't apologize, Mr. Sidney. It was very silly of me. Let's not talk about it anymore, shall we? Of course not. How would you like to go for a stroll? Perhaps we can show you some of the plantation. Are you sure you have nothing more important to do? Certainly not. Mr. Sidney's too busy, I'd be delighted. I believe you're trying to deprive me of the pleasure of Miss Calvin's company. Right. That's very kind of both of you. It's our pleasure, my dear. There's the old sugar house over there. They made their own sugar right here on the place in the old days. The bayou was part of the river. Shallow enough to wade in some places. Very deep in others. Quite dangerous. Only last year a woman went under the quicksand. We heard her hollering, but by the time we got there, she was gone. She had been carrying a wash basket, and there it was. Right where she went down, parking the spot. It's dangerous ground altogether. But you know it very well. You shouldn't go around alone for the first few weeks. Leave or I will join you. She's right, you can't be too careful. Must be awful drowning in quicksand. Much worse than water. Water's cleaner, at least. Faster. Please, please. Speak of Leslie. It's all right, Mr. City. Don't worry about me. You're a brave girl. But I know what Reeves' words are reminding you of. What? Well, how about a ride the boat? Mr. Sidney! Yeah, I am. You ought to squad you on the telephone. I'm coming. Now that we finally got rid of that walking phonograph, I'll show you around. Oh, no, thank you. But you haven't seen the place, and I'm a much better guide than Mr. Sidney. I'd rather not. I know tumble-down buildings bore me, too, but then we're both still young enough to have other interests, aren't we? For instance? Well, I mean, I thought we could have some fun, laughs together. I'd like to go in town some night and see a picture show. That'd be very nice some night. I'll show you around the bayou. Come on, get in the boat. Oh, no, thank you. I'd rather not. I don't like birds. Oh, yes, you do. That's the only way to really see the place. We have birds and flowers out that you've never even seen. I'd rather not. Well, you can't go on being a coward. She's not a coward. Oh, hello, George. Hello, Leslie. You see, she's following my orders. I told her to stay away from boats for a while. Your orders? And just who are you? He's my doctor. Dr. Grover, this is Mr. Keene. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? I didn't know you'd given her orders to stay ashore. I just thought a boat ride might be good for her. Well, I'm sure it would. Later on. Look, I've got a few calls to make in my car. You want to come along? Oh, I'd love to. That's all right with you, Cleve, isn't it? Sh sure. Let's go, Leslie. I'll admit the Bayou country has its drawbacks. Too many mosquitoes, not enough ice skating. The scenery's in. Take it easy. It's the pig in the road. I almost hit him. It's all your fault, too. My fault? I used to be able to keep my eyes on the road when I was driving along. Well, you hear that? Those are boudreaux. What kind of animals are those? Let's see. Mama and Papa Boudreaux, this is Miss Leslie Calvin. How do you do? How do you do, mademoiselle? Very, very pleased. And this is Jeanette, and Eugenie, and Cécile, and Eulalie. And Caramac. And Yvette. She's a little shy at first. But when she gets to know you, she'll talk your ear off. Like all my women. Papa, Jeanette, put your dirty hands down. Hey, wait a minute. They're all here. Yes, Doctor, we are all here. Well, where's the patient? The patient? The pony on the guard told me a Boudreaux had fallen out of the tree. It was me. But you weren't hurt. It was very high, please. He knocked out his whip. I'm not that myself. Well, let's have a look here now. Is he 
right, Doctor? I'm afraid I'll have to prescribe something for it. <laughs> hey, what is this, an epidemic? <laughs> Me too. You stay for lunch, huh? Oh, I still got a couple of calls to make. Oh, oh sure, they will stay. Doctor, we have shrimps. Shrimps I caught this morning. Shrimp for la Mama Boudreau? <laughs> shrimps that I myself. You never tasted shrimp the way Mama Boudreau fixes them. <laughs> How you stay single so long, I don't know, but maybe not much longer. <laughs> Children, entertain our guests while I go and pick some shrimp salad myself. How do you like a plant in Montel? What did we build it ourselves? How about our dough tomorrow night? Will you bring it to the show? I'd love to. Please, please. What is the place? Oh, the place is there. Well, it means go to sleep. Why are you little ones resting? They're them dancing on the plant. Up there is the music. Oh, the fiddle. Oh, the fiddle. Everyone comes. Yes, they dance. Oh, oh, yes, they dance. Wonderful. It's no good. What did you say? I said the fellow door is no good. They put us to bed. <laughs> Let us walk on the platform. Children, come and wash your hands and face. Lunch is ready. Come on, quick. Well, now you know what a boudreau is. How do you like them? I love them, all of them. I like Steely Bet and Telemac, too. Well, Mama Boudreau's the one to kidnap. She's a great cook. Even in a country that considers cooking more important than... Well, in politics. Do they take it that seriously? Well, do they? The Bayou boys don't propose to the pretty girls. They marry the good cooks. Oh, but that's been our own egg. All I can do is boil an egg. Wait a minute. I like boiled eggs. I do. Children, children, your manners. Mademoiselle, monsieur, en fait. Soyez sage, soit la manifante. I'm sorry it's over. Well, it needn't be. We could have dinner. Evening, Leslie. Hello, Doctor. Brought home just in time. Dinner's on the table. Oh, I hope I'm not late. Not late. We're having a derby. We're all going to the movies. Oh. Well, goodbye. I'll see you tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Good night, Doctor. Very nice, Chester. Have a good time. Wonderful. Bye. Confiscated films made by enemy cameramen and taken from a captured German submarine in the North Atlantic show the ruthless submarine warfare as carried on by our enemies on the high seas. They are their own record of wanton and indiscriminate slaughter. The submarine cruises over the North Atlantic seeking victims day and night. Suddenly a ship is sighted. The alarm is given. The men run to their battle stations. Slowly the submarine maneuvers into position for the kill. Perhaps it is an unarmed merchantman. Perhaps due to some breakdown, it has had to drop out of a convoy. Maybe it carries refugees, helpless men, women, and children rescued from tyranny and oppression, and now at last on their way to peace and a new life. 
the submarine reaches the chosen position. Orders are shouted. And without warning, a torpedo is fired. To make sure of the kill, a second torpedo. Death streaks through the wave. With a crash, the ship is broken and bursts into flame. There is no chance to launch the lifeboats. Helpless victims leap into the water, clutching onto anything that can help them to keep afloat. The boat burns fiercely, and then... Back is broken. Cleve, you should have found out what the show is. Oh, I know this would upset her so much. I'm sorry, my dear. We'll take you home right away. Excuse me, Mum. Are you Miss Leslie? Who are you? I'm Pearson Jackson, Miss Leslie. And I'd like to talk with you. Oh, Pearson Jackson, you frightened me. What did you want to talk to me about? Well, Florella told me you were nice and kind, Miss Leslie. And she said if I told you, and you knew that I had been treated wrong, that you'd most likely help me to find out. Well, I worked here 12 years, Miss Leslie. 12 years. And just three or four days after your aunt and uncle came down here from New York, why, Mr. Cleave up and gave me my pay and told me to go. Without any reason? Yes, ma'am. No reason at all, Miss Leslie. And that's what I'd like to find out about. Because I belong here. A man gets a pride for a place after 12 years. I think I understand how you feel, Pearson. And I'm sure Aunt Emily will, if you'll just tell her. But that's just what I can't get a chance to do, Miss Leslie. The day that I was let go, I asked to speak to Mr. and Mrs. Lamar. And Mr. Cleave told me they were feeling poorly. He told me to go and stay gone. And I came back three or four times to see Mr. Cleave. And he ran me off. Ran me off. Pearson Jackson off Rosingham. I'll try to find out, Pearson. I'll talk to Aunt Emily for you. Thank you, Miss Leslie. And I'll be much obliged. But don't you run no risk of getting yourself into trouble just for me. Oh, it won't be any trouble, Pearson. I hope not, Miss Leslie. But things around here have changed. Well, this place isn't like it used to be. Why, well, remember? That's Mr. Cleve's car. Good day, Miss Leslie. Mm -hmm.
I came up to see how you were. Feeling better? Emily's busy with Norbert, so I came to find out what you'd want for dinner. I don't care about any dinner. Mm, I was afraid you wouldn't want to go down, so I brought you an egg and sherry. Did you get any sleep at all? Well, maybe after a little egg and sherry, if you try again. Now, you must not get discouraged. You're really making progress, you know. After a shock such as you've had, one doesn't recover all at once. Don't you give up. You had a little setback last night, but you're not any worse. Your uncle mentioned getting a psychiatrist, but that isn't necessary. You just get all the sleep you can and have patience. I'd rather anyway. Yes, ma'am. Can't you relish your dinner, Miss Leslie? Oh, I'm just not hungry, Florella. I don't even think I'll go to the Fado Do. Fado Do? Oh, but Miss Leslie, you better go. It'll help to raise your spirit. I'm afraid it would take a lot more than that. Oh, you've had your dinner, Dr. Grover. Yes, thank you. Well, a cup of coffee. Maybe a glass of iced tea. Or Emily, a... maybe Dr. Grover would like something a little more stimulating. Oh, thank you, really. I... I don't want anything. I just came to take Leslie to the Fado Do. Hello, Leslie. You ready for the festivities? I don't know, George. I, mean, I really don't think you should. You haven't been at all well. And exactly. Leslie's been under the weather. She's been in bed all day. What's the matter? Don't you feel well? I don't feel ill, George, but... Well, don't you think it might do you some good? I promise not to keep her out too late, Mrs. Lamont. Dr. Grover, she hadn't had a bit of rest all last night. This is really out of the question, Doctor. Well, let's hear what Leslie has to say. Wouldn't you like to go? I think I would. This is most ill-advised. After I'll all... I'll prescribe for Leslie, Mr. Sidney. We won't be late, Aunt Emily. I'll go up and change. I'll be down in a moment. I'm sorry if I sounded abrupt. But as I told you, she needs to be cheered up.
for you all night. This is wonderful. How often do they have these affairs? Oh, every couple of weeks or so. Here's to the next one. Here's to the next one. And the one after that. <laughs> certainly took to that square dancing as if you'd lived here all your life. Thank you. Mama Boudreaux said you must have been born dancing. Oh, no, not until I was three. I used to dance for my mother. She taught you? No, mother never danced. She was an invalid. She never walked from the time she was a child. My father always carried her. She used to say that my feet would have to do all the dancing for the two of us. Well, she couldn't have made a better choice. <laughs> Don't touch that. Why not? If you touch that, the door opens. The door opens, you might get out. If you get out, I wouldn't be able to. Leslie, being a country doctor's wife isn't much of a life for a woman. But if you'd overlook the bad parts, George. I'd try awfully hard to make it worth the trouble. No. Darling, I love you. I mustn't say that. But Leslie, I'm asking you to marry no. me. Leslie, what's wrong? I can't ever tell you. I mustn't see you like this. I must never see you again. Leslie, dear. Did you have a good time? I had a wonderful time. Why, Leslie, you're crying. Oh, we shouldn't have let you go. You're all tired out. I'll always blame myself. It's me. You mustn't talk like that. What happened to upset you? Tell me. He asked me to marry Dr. Grover. And you don't want to? But I do. I do, Lady. Why? I don't understand. Because I can't ever marry him or anyone else. But why, dear? You thought you were going out no. of your... You mustn't say or think such things. You're much better. I'm not. I'm not. All the time I see and hear things that are not there. Last night I heard the radio and it wasn't even connected. Even their right minds don't have hallucinations. Poor child. Did you tell Dr. Grover about it? No. No, and I'm never going to see him again. Oh, why did they pull me out of the water? That's where I belong. Under the water with my mother and father. Leslie. Leslie. Aunt Emily? Yes? Did you call? Did you call? Why, no, dear. Oh. That's funny. I thought I heard you. I'm sorry. Good night, dear. Good night.
Listen, it's you. Miss Leslie, did you hear your name being called? What? What did you say? Yes, ma'am. What do you mean, yes, ma'am? Did you hear voices calling my name? Yes, ma'am, I sure did. You heard them. You heard them. And they're really there. Yes, Miss Leslie. They say this place is haunted. But you shouldn't be rambling around in the dark like this, Miss Leslie. Well, what are you doing here? I gotta find out. And when I do, I'll let you know. I'll let you know tomorrow, maybe. I'll go up to the house and then I'll know. But there's one thing I do know, Miss Leslie. They're after you because they're calling your name. And you better get back into the house right this minute. All right, Pearson, I'll go, but... Well, there's the path there, Miss Leslie. I'll watch you from here until you're safe back to the house. Yeah. George Grover, please. I don't know the telephone number. Hello, George. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, would you please give him a message? Would you ask him to call Leslie Calvin? It's very important. Dear, come in. What are you doing up at this hour? It's dreadfully late. I want to talk to you, Aunt Emily. Mm. Lonely, are you, poor darling? Did anything special happen tonight to upset you? Aunt Emily, tell me about Mr. Sidney. What do you want to know about him, dear? How long have you known him? Oh, a very long time. He and your uncle have been friends since school days. He was best man at our wedding, you know. Does he... Have much to do with Uncle Norbert's affairs? Oh, yes, he handles everything. He's so practical, I mean, in money matters. Norbert hasn't a practical bone in his body. And you completely trust Mr. Sidney? Why, yes, darling. I'm astonished that you should ask. What made you? What about Mr. Cleve? What is this, dear? How much do you know about Mr. Cleve? Only that he's a very good overseer. Mr. Sidney says he's done wonders with the plantation. Improvements, I mean. It's got to be them, or one of them. What has to be who, dear? Aunt Emily, I told you I thought I heard voices calling me. I thought they weren't real voices. They were. I wasn't having hallucinations. Somebody else heard them, too. Pearson heard them. Oh, but he couldn't have. Or if he did, he was just imagining. I mean, oh, that would be silly, too, wouldn't it? I don't believe in ghosts, do you? It was somebody who was trying to make me think I was losing my mind. But why? For what earthly reason? I don't know. Well, I... I can't imagine that anyone out of sheer meanness would... It's not Mr. Sidney. Certainly. That's out of the question. I'll tell Norbert. He'll get to the bottom of it. Aunt Emily, you don't know how relieved I am. About the voices, I mean. Well, of course, dear. I thought I'd never dare to fall in love, ever. He seems a very nice young man. When he asked me to marry him, I said no, because I thought... Well, don't fret, darling. He'll ask you again, I'm sure. You'll be married right here. Your mother's wedding veil is in the attic. I think we'll look tomorrow. Oh, she was lovely. Her happiness made her radiant. No one wept at that wedding. Your grandmother said, I'm not losing a daughter. I'm gaining a son. Aunt Emily, you and mother were very close, weren't you? Inseparable, darling, from childhood. Tell me about the things you used to do together. Oh, we did all of the usual things that little girls do. We played with dolls. Mother said that Grandfather used to be very strict with you. He was, even for those days. But we managed to have a little fun as we were growing up. She used to tell me about all the bows you used to have and all the parties you used to Oh, do. but she was the popular one, dear. She never missed a dance. Her dance program was always filled first. In those days, we had a pencil with a little tassel on it. Did Mother like to dance? Oh, she adored it. Because we didn't have the modern dances. We waltzed and two-stepped and polkaed. Was she a good dancer? 
I hadn't loved her so much, I'd have been jealous. Maybe I was just a mite jealous anyway. Oh, she was as light as a feather, the best of all the girls. Oh, there's Norbert with the tea things. We always like a cup of tea before retiring. Oh, that's right. Good evening. Come on, darling. Have a cup of tea with us. It'll make you sleep. Norbert makes much better tea than I do. Because I always warm the pot before I put in the leaves. I hope you like it a little strong. A spoon for each cup and one for the pot. It's the way your grandmother used to make it, dear. You want milk? Yes. Please. Norbert, Leslie's told me the most extraordinary thing. She wants your advice. Yes? Will you give her a cookie, please? Oh, yeah. No, thank you. Oh, but they're homemade. No, but Leslie thinks that Cleve and Mr. Sidney... Do you take sugar? No. No, but Leslie thinks... Drink your tea, darling. He isn't there yet. No, ma'am. He's out on a call. I don't know where. And he didn't say when he'd be back. Oh. Well, will you please tell him that Leslie Calvin called? Yes. Thank you. You're sure anxious to get hold of that guy. I wish some girl would call me up three times. Do you? Leslie? Here's your lemonade. Did you forget it? I thought you might have, so I brought it down to you. Thank or do you want to bring it upstairs? Pearson? Yes, Miss Leslie. Keep out of sight. Keep out of sight. Sidney's watching me. You're in danger, Miss Leslie. I saw him this morning. Careful, he's looking at us. They're not your real aunt and uncle, Miss Leslie. They're trying to fool you. I know. Go away, Pearson. He's coming towards us. I'll stay by you if you want me to. No, no, not now. I'm not afraid, Miss Leslie. Meet me tonight at the bayou. Go, Pearson, hurry. Taking a walk? Hot, isn't it? Well, nights like this were made for sleeping anyway. You might get hurt walking around the woods alone. When's your doctor friend coming around again? You go for him, don't you? You know, you and I could have a lot of fun together if you'd just be yourself for a minute.
Is that you, Leslie? Oh, I... I was thirsty. I thought I'd go down yes, and... Yes, ice water in here. But I don't want to disturb you. Come in. Yes, come in. Oh, it's too hot to sleep. I think I'll have a cigarette. Emily, uh, didn't I bring up my cigarettes? Here you are, dear. Yes, I think so. Look there on the table. Oh, oh, yes. Here they are. Try to sleep. Good night. Good night. Good morning, Miss Leslie. Good morning. Oh, Leslie, sit down. I'll get your breakfast in a moment. I'll tell Flora. She didn't come this morning. She simply didn't come. You can't depend on... Emily. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. What have you done with the chicken livers? Oh, dear, I only cooked them. You simply um, sit down. I'll get my breakfast. Oh, no, no. You stay right here. I'll get you something right away. People who cook like Emily should stick to simple things. Look at these chicken livers. Ruined beyond repair. George? Yeah. Oh, George, I've been trying to get you. When are you coming out? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to remember you saying you didn't want to see me again. A girl can change her mind, can't she? Well, yeah, I suppose so. Look, Leslie, I've been up all night on a case, and I'm still kind of tied up, but I tell you, I'll catch up on my sleep this afternoon and drop out this evening. Oh, good. Then I'll expect you right away. Leslie, what is this? You'll be here in an hour. I'll be waiting for you. Well, I don't get it. But if it's got you doing double talk, I'll come out as soon as I can. Thank you. Was that George, dear? Yes. Such a nice young man. Is he coming to see you? Yes. In a little while. I'm going to the field office. Anything else you want me to take down? No, that's all. Your young doctor seems quite attentive. There's not much competition around here. I don't think George could see anyone else but there were. I think you're partial on Emily. Leslie, I believe you're blushing. Well, I shall take my constitutional. I'll leave you the porch free of inconvenient dollars. You shouldn't walk so much in this heat. I'm always telling him that he won't listen. I'll leave you too, dear. I'm going up to my room to lie down. You wish your uncle would stop this typing and take a little rest. Good afternoon, George. Good afternoon, Mrs. Lamar. Hello, Leslie. Hello, George. I, I know you children will excuse me. Uh, help yourself with some lemonade. It will cool you off. Thank you. Leslie, what's the matter? Oh, George, thank God you've come. I thought I was going mad, really mad. I wasn't before mad, I mean. I did hear voices. They weren't just in my mind. Pearson heard them, too. 
He's dead. They killed him. Now, wait a minute, Leslie. Let me get this straight. I found him down by the bayou. They killed him because he, he told my real aunt and uncle before they came. They aren't. They're imposters. They wanted me to think I'd heard things. They made the lights go on and off. Oh, George, George, thank God you've come. Darling, what are you talking about? That was why I said I couldn't marry you. It was because I thought I was losing my mind. But I'm not really. It was something they were doing. Darling, you're much too excited. Now, try to be calm. George, George, I'm a prisoner. They stood guard, so I didn't dare. You must take me away right now. I will. I will take you away, darling, but... But what? Leslie, please listen to me. What you need most is a few hours sleep. George, you don't know what you're saying. I, I'm in terrible danger. If we don't hide, they'll kill me like they killed Pearson. You don't believe me. You think I'm imagining. Well, the imagination's a very powerful force. We can all see and hear things that aren't really there. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the mind. It's nerves with you, darling. Now listen, I'll be back here sometime tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow will be too late. I want you to take this prescription. The directions are here. And please go to bed. Will you, darling? George, please. Darling, please do as I say. Busy, Dr. Grover, finishing up his report. But I'm at your service if there's anything I can do. Well, I'm worried about Leslie. Very worried. She's been telling me some pretty fantastic things. Seems to, seems to think she's a prisoner here. I'm afraid she's getting a persecution complex. Talks about murders, imposters. Sounds pretty wild. Good gracious. She's getting worse. Well, that's not all. She told me Mr. and Mrs. Lamont. <laughs> Serious, Dr. Grover? Yes, as a matter of fact, she mustn't stay here any longer, Mr. Sidney. There's no telling what she might do to herself in her condition. And the best thing we can do is get hold of a good psychiatrist. Yeah, I'll take care of that. Well, why not let me do it? I know a good man in New Orleans. I'll make all the arrangements and come back for her as soon as I can. Can you spare that time? Yes, of course I can. I want to do everything possible for Leslie. Then I suppose the only thing we can do is just wait. Yes, I've given her some pills. Maybe she can rest. Better not disturb her for a while. Oh, we'll do everything we can. I'm sure you will. Goodbye. Bye, Doctor. Oh, uh, by the way, Doctor, could you drop me off at the field office? Sure, I'd be glad to. Pop in. Thanks. Thank Sydney. I'm getting tired of playing Uncle Norbert, of talking and eating with my chin stuck out. I think I've stuck my chin out a little too far, as it is. I'm not making any bones about it. I'm mighty worried. That young doctor may be here any minute. He said he'd be back in two days, but he might change his mind. We may be at none of our business, but it does affect Pinky and me. What I'd like to know is, what do you have in your mind to do? Get the girl, May. You're not going to harm her, are you? If anything bad, I mean really bad, should happen to Leslie, I don't know what I'd do. I've grown terribly fond of her. I don't want her hurt. I'm afraid all sentimental considerations must be put aside for the time being. We, uh, we didn't bargain for anything like Murder, Sidney. If either of you have anything constructive to propose... We refuse to have any part of it. We didn't bargain for anything like this. Now, you might just as well count us out. And as far as our share of the proceeds are concerned, well, you can keep it. 
Not that we haven't earned it. We've done everything we agreed to, even more. As far as the money is concerned, I'll tell you the truth. We need it. We need it badly. I'll pack our things, Pinky. Sit down, May. I won't sit down. We're getting out of here as soon as we can. Stop it, Pinky. Wait a minute, May. I won't wait for anything. I'm your husband. You're going to do as I say. Now, let's try to be reasonable for a moment. Nothing you can say will make me change my mind. My mind's made up. Oh, shut your mouth, May. Don't you be rude to me. My instinct is to clear out, too. I'm just as anxious to be rid of this whole thing as you are. It's messy, and I don't like messes. Unfortunately, we can't pick and choose. Now, suppose we were to pull up our traces of light out. How far do you think we'd get? To the state line? I wish you'd stop using we as though Pinky and I had any part of it. You're in this up to your necks, whether you like it or not. When we accepted your offer to come up here and be the Lamont... Surely you've guessed by now what happened to the Lamonts. Less said the better about such things, but a fact is a fact. You mean they're dead? Did you, uh... Cleave. You should have told us when you made us the offer. It wasn't fair not to tell us. Why, well, of course it wasn't. May's right. That was done before we got here. We had nothing to do with it. True. But I think you'd find it very difficult to make a jury believe that. Bring the girl down, May. Pretty little romance she's having with that doctor, isn't it? Well, there's no use dwelling on the unpleasant side of things. But what are we going to tell the doctor? You should thank your stars, Pinky, that one member of this concern has a little foresight. yourself unless you like being hit over the head. Mosquitoes bothering you? <laughs> well, it won't be long now. You mean I won't have to worry about scratching the bites? Want a drink? Yeah. in your fix, I'd want to get cockeyed too. Thanks. Okay, sport. How long have I been out? Oh, two or three hours this last time. Oh, now look. Now you ain't gonna cause any more fuss, I hope. Because if you do, you're just gonna get slugged again as per Mr. Sidney's instructions. You do everything Sidney says? I got a mind of my own. Yeah, but what happened to Leslie? I reckon I get gas. But I won't. Same thing that happened to the real Lamonts? Maybe. They're out in the bayou under the water hyacinths. How'd you know? I didn't. That's right, sport. That's where they are. Out in the bayou, all right. Why are you afraid of Sydney? Who, me? Afraid? Mm hmm I ain't afraid of nobody. I notice you do all the dirty work, don't you? What dirty work? Well, I can't see Sydney pulling the trigger or sticking the knife. With you to do it for him, why should he soil his lily white hands? George. George, don't. Leslie, don't worry. You're hurt. Stop the boat up. He come to and start raising a fuss, so I banged him over the head again. Leave, you've been drinking. Says you. You 
got no right to do that, Mr. Sidney. No impudence now, young man. Well, look, I don't like being ordered around like dirt under somebody's feet. Be polite. Ask me please to do something. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But I don't like being ordered around. Dog, if I'll take orders. Leave. Two different boys. Leave drunk, leave sober. Tell me, Sidney, what's so important that it's worth the lives of five people? Home recorded. We set it for a certain time. And the lamp? That was you too? Cleve, I know nothing about electricity. Simple devices. Too bad they failed to serve their purpose. Too bad, I mean, Doctor, for Leslie. You see, we've done everything we could for Leslie. But you didn't answer my question. What in your mind is worth the lives of five people? Why, money, Doctor, what else? Hurry, Cleve. Only got two hands. And how much money will these particular murders bring? $300,000 minus agent's fees, of course. We could get a good deal more. With plantations skyrocketing in value. But considering we have no time to dicker, it's a fairish price. Must have been an awful nuisance, my arriving when I did. By the way, George is pretty well known around here. What are you going to say when people come asking after him? We'll tell them you eloped. They'd believe it long enough for us to finish our business and be off. What do you mean, us? You aren't telling me, are you, that you intend to cut Auntie and Uncle and Cleve in? I beg pardon? You will have committed five murders for money. Well, why not eight for more money? Take Cleve now. What's going to keep you from disposing of Cleve after he's disposed of us? That'd only be good business according to your lights. And then after Cleve comes Auntie's turn, and then Uncle's. The boat's ready. Good boy, Cleve. Untie him. Don't turn your back on him. And keep your gun off safety. Shut up, you. I'm only telling you for your own good. I don't want any more blood on this floor. I've told you about blood stains. They're a giveaway. Untie him. Come. Yeah, now that you don't trip. All right, come on, get up. Let's get going. taking any chances on you pulling a fast one, Sidney. A fast one? You know what I mean. My dear boy, you're not going to take what this fellow said seriously. There's only going to be one gun in this boat, Sidney. Mine. That's telling them, please. Shut up, you. Put your revolver over the side and let go of it. Dr. Grover, you poisoned this boy's mind. I'm tempted to do this job on you myself. Are you going to do like I say, Sidney? Get out of this 
Last ball. Jump. Give it to me. Flashlight. Where are you? You ever got a 
chance. Where are you? Uh, I'm stuck. Give me a hand, will you? I'm sinking. Oh, the quicksand. Oh, Don't struggle. Oh, you can't get out by yourself. Please, God, help me. Don't kill me, Mr. Sidney. Help me. Help. I can't get out. Help me, Mr. Sidney. Mr. Sidney, help me. Help, Mr. Sidney. Save me. Please. like solid ground, but it isn't. One step that way and you'll go down just as Cleve did. No use looking, Sidney. Start walking and take your chances. But remember, you only get one wrong guess because I won't pull you out. Well, come on, make up your mind. What are you going to do? Better throw me that gun. You only got one bullet left, and if you shoot me, you'll stay here forever. it would have been quite safe for you to walk back to the boat. There isn't any quicksand here. Only back there. But of course, you couldn't tell that. This way. Go on. You'd better take the wheel, darling. Sit down, Sidney. The starter button's on the dash. Go ahead, darling. There's nothing to be afraid of now. I'm all right. 